How about that? That's better? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, actually, because I have to start teaching my class in New York in about, I don't know, at 4, 4 p.m. in New York. So, um, uh, and they'll be doing much, uh, they'll be um, replicating or trying to replicate what the um, students have been doing here, which has been just a great privilege to um, <coughs> discuss some really interesting and hard issues which I'd like to try and summarize today around the idea of what is the technological opportunity that that we're presented with now. How can we seize that for social and environmental change? What can we do? And uh, Patch Bay is obviously the platform, this kind of real-time geolocated information. How does that change what we can do? What can we do? What should we do? What might we do? I think these are the questions that we have to ask with our technologies. Um, so I just want to kind of go through a set of examples of the way that I've used um, particular technological opportunities. I've tried to put in there some air quality issues um, to really, you know, interrogate what is our opportunity um, now. Uh, so, um, just briefly, I'm not an architect, but um, so I have to explain a little bit about what it is that I do. Um, and uh, institutionally, I've set myself up as the Environmental Health Clinic. So, what the Environmental Health Clinic is... Uh, ...is a twist on health, a redefinition of health not as something that's internal and biological and individualized and medicalized and pharmaceuticalized, but as something that is external and shared. It's in the air quality, the air that you're breathing now. It's in the food systems that, uh, through which you um, nourish yourself. It's in the water. It's in the shared environmental commons that we all act on and are responsible for. So. Um, so, quite literally, this is a redefinition um, of health, um, and I, you know, I, I need to motivate it um, again because this is something that I'm not sure how much it's penetrated the um, the creative imagination um, of what are the health issues, particularly when we start to talk about environmental issues, or the 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 reason to frame environmental issues as health issues and health issues as environmental issues, right? Um, and this is just one study, and there's many more like it, that looks at surveys what pediatricians do when, they, um, when they're seeing children, right? They, um, uh, uh, they 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of their time is taken up by five top issues that are dominate their time, what they do with their patients. And you can probably guess, the students can probably guess what is the number one issue? that they spend their time on? Asthma. Asthma. <laughs> Good. Um, uh, asthma, reactive airways. Um, number two is um, developmental delays, ADD, ADHD. Is that a champagne yeah. popping? <laughs> Can you ask them to bring it in here? <laughs> um, number three and four uh, three is 400-fold increases in rare childhood cancers in the last 15 years. Number four and five is diabetes, um, which is a conflation of di childhood diabetes and and childhood obesity issues. So there's you know a pand uh, an epidemic of six-month-old babies with obesity issues. Right? These are big issues. Right? This is um, uh, we've designed an urban system that produces this. What are we going to do about it? So. Um, this idea of reframing environmental issues not as the polar bear on the melting snow caps, but as, not somewhere else, but as right here in your room. The, the advantage of this framework is that anything you do to improve your environmental health, your air quality, your water quality, your any design that you do, the benefits are shared, unlike a pharmaceutical drug or a you know, a vitamin that you might take, the benefits are shared by anyone you share that environmental context with, that air quality, that water quality, that environmental health. So the environmental commons is what we can act on, it's what we share, it's what our opportunity is to do. Um, you know, I like a couple of other 
uh, ways to do this. There's a, um, the statistician did a really nice, David Allison did a really nice survey of, of um, 20,000 animals that live in proximity to humans, either with us or as lab animals, as pets or as feral animals, to see if the obesity epidemic was replicated in them. In any of them, did any of the species show um, the obesity epidemic? You know the answer to this, right? All of them did. Every single lab rat, uh, well, there's data sets on the lab rats, which is peculiar, right? Because lab rats are kept in the same housing. They've been very, it was very good records on how much they've been fed. And yet there's an obesity epidemic going on. So what does that tell us? It's in the environment, right? Um, and I think we can listen to our animals, our cohabiting animals quite carefully. Um, so, uh, uh, in order to do this, um, I enlisted them through um, developing some communication technologies for them. This is a, a project called Perch. Um, when birds need a perch, they land on this and it triggers a sound file. Let's see if we can play this. It triggers a sound file that might say um, something like this. Here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Okay. Um, Tick. Actually, so, um, so the thing is I've set this up in a number of places, Mass Mocha and the Whitney and a few other places. If patch pay had existed at the, that time, they would have been, um, the data would have been logged to. To patch bay, but the um, but we can um, learn something from it. And in this case, in the case of the Whitney Museum, for instance, I had six different perches, each with a different argument on it that um, you know was effectively eliciting cooperative behaviour from the people below. So one had an argument about, come on, the copyright used for all the melodic resources and cell phone ringtones, come, you know, pay up, right? So. The, uh, and, but the, by far, so each of the arguments was an opportunity for the birds to experiment on people, right, to see which best elicited this cooperative behavior. And the most popular one by about eight to one, the one that the birds decided was most useful, most effective, um, was this argument. Now here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Tick, tick, tick. That's the sound of Jun This was, this was the most popular tick, item. I want tick, to sure. tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. Okay, so um, naturally, you know, there's a systems uh, analysis behind this that, you know, uh, immediately suggests that what we've done is create uh, food systems that have become cauldrons of pathogenicity and produced a whole uh, number of epidemics, including swine flu and avian flu. Um, but um, so our animals um, have how we live very much affects our animals and uh, our animals affect us. Um, so the clinic works in a very um, straightforward way and it's a replicable model that um, uh, people like at most universities, there's a health, a health clinic, mine is, is at a university as well. People who come to the clinic are called impatients rather than patients because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to, to address environmental health, to improve environmental health. So um, uh, we meet in the clinic um, 
you know, they come with environmental health concerns as opposed to medical health concerns and they walk out with prescriptions for things they can do to improve environmental health as opposed to pharmaceuticals. Um, but we have these field offices as well, um, which uh, in this case this is a floating raft that's not floating. I don't know why I'm showing this one. Here it is in the East River. It's a very good place to talk about um, uh, water quality, right, immersed in this context. Um, great views. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, in Belgium where we um, had a field office to talk about um, to talk about air quality. This really smells when you're um, sitting here. But um, but what's the, the most important thing about citing the field office here of the Environmental Health Clinic was in order to um, exploit the very familiar icon of the roundabout which um, demonstrates a familiar uh, and working headless social movement. And I think there's few, um, if you contrast this to a red light traffic intersection, which we take as the norm for ordering our traffic, where you have to delegate your responsibility for making a decision about whether it's safe to go with your car, your body, your health, you know, your investment, um, to some remote authority, right? Um, even if it's safe, you can't go, right? You'll get a red light ticket, right? Um, you, um, but at, at a roundabout, it depends on the micro decisions of each one of us to coordinate, to, um, and we get higher throughput and fewer accidents at the roundabout. We don't see them a lot because they're, they tend to be more space intensive, but they work, right? They work as an icon of a form of social organization, of a structure of participation that we are heavily dependent on and yet have few cultural representations in which to really think that through. Um, this is actually the current field office in Noguchi, uh, in, the, in Socrates. Um, it's also a nice way to talk about um, air quality um, and the stratification of air quality, the different boundary layers as you go up and down. Um, it's a nice um, ride. But these um, ideas, this is one of the prescriptions that we started off with um, talking about what uh, air quality could be in the interconnections of an irreducibly complex socio-ecological system that we call our urban centers, right, and how we think through them. This is one of the more popular prescriptions and actually, interestingly, one of the more challenging prescriptions out of the clinic. What you can see is it's an emergency vehicle parking space like those associated with fire hydrants in New York City um, to address this issue which is um, recently um, I think important to note that in the 20 of the 40 major cities the, um, that are built on estuaries, um, they, uh, the biggest pollution burden is no longer the big point sources, the big industrial facilities. It's now the uh, massive network of those impervious surfaces that we call roads and network uh, roads and sidewalks right that creates the biggest pollution burden right uh, that requires radically different strategies from the traditional legislative strategies of regulating or suing the deep pockets the big polluters the big corporations that we've blamed for our you know the difference being that who's used a sidewalk or a road lately right we are all implicated. <laughs> we are all responsible. And how do we transform that? We can't sue somebody, you know. In fact, sue me, you won't get much, right? Um, so it's, uh, it doesn't, the traditional ways of engaging environmentalism don't work and we really do need to develop interesting and uh, strategies that respond to that. So, so uh, here's that pollutant. Um, that you know is that you know those very pretty shimmers of hydrocarbon, oily, um, cadmium, neurotoxicant, mercury, um, the toxic soup that we wash into our bodies of water. Um, and here's um, one of the prescriptions, the no park. So the no park prescribes the removal of the asphalt to create an engineered micro landscape which intercepts that roadborne pollution and inter infiltrates it, but also redefines the uh, redefines the emergency, right? A fire truck can continue to park on, on this. If they flatten a few plants, it's no big deal. You know, they'll regenerate. It's the nature of, the plants are very critical for keeping the, the, um, the permeability of the substrate to be able to um, 
to do this. Um, we set these up. Uh, this is Muki, one of the inpatients from the clinic, setting it up. Um, she's sitting there with uh, talking to one of her neighbours, enlisting uh, people. But just uh, quickly, we redefine the emergency so that uh, to go back to this um, image, so that now when there's not a fire truck pl there, you know, it uh, it's servicing the environmental health emergency. It's intercepting wa uh, water. It's also creating. Um, as we know from the workshop, um, the leaf area index is our only technology, our only proven technology for improving air quality, right? And so um, the worst boundary layer of urban air is at that stroller height where all the heavy hydrocarbons are, where the tailpipes are, where we have this um, toxic soup. We, we know that approximately, you know, the kid in the stroller has a thousand times worse air quality than the than the adults standing behind them. Um, and so leaf area index, surgically inserted here, has about a thousand times more effect than the leaf area index in that street tree above it, right? So um, just uh, the aggregate of these small interventions, and there's many forms of them, is that in Manhattan, if we transformed every um, of the fire hydrants, there's one or two on every city block in Manhattan, we would infiltrate all the roadborne pollution up to the 100-year storm event, up to the annual 100-year storm event that we get now with um, climate stabilization. So the aggregation of small interventions can amount to significant effect. Um, we're doing a version of this mask in um, the, the um, workshop at the moment, but um, so I won't go through it in, we'll have some more uh, details to, to share with it, but it um, what it does address is the kind of representational challenge with it that we face in taking something as complex as air quality and what we've been doing is talking about the qualities of air in order to resist the simplification of air quality to a, a list of numbers that really are meaningless to most people most of the time um, into a representation like this which is the Clear Skies Mask, named after the Bush administration's Clear Skies Initiative, which ironically, after its name and kind of paradoxically and, and I think um, symptomatic of our time, Clear Skies meant more pollution. Clear Skies meant, the Clear Skies Initiative was the dismantling of the Clean Air Act. It meant 17-fold increases in mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. Clear Skies meant dirty air, right? That's all well would call that doublespeak, right? <laughs> Words are failing us. Representations no longer work. Um, and so different strategies that have higher standards of evidence that um, might be used in this case, what we're doing is creating a mask that the gray grime that, uh, that um, taken a standard OSHA approved mask and screen printed a grayscale on it, and the grime that, that appears on it as you wear it around, that would otherwise circulate in your bloodstream, lodge in your pretty pink lungs. Actually, you can read off the rate of accumulation from the grayscale and have a, a robust and trustable measure of the uh, air quality to which you're exposed. You can compare it with your neighbor. It's obviously radically inexpensive. Um, they actually are about one euro each. Um, this is another um, newer project that um, exploits the mobility and the situatedness of information. Um, so this actually takes um, the point of view display that you might have seen and LEDs, LEDs on, uh, on bikes. This is the low res version, but we have a 256 LED version of this. Um, so as the, when the bike gets to about five miles an hour, you actually create images in the wheels. Right, and uh, there's a couple of people that have developed these POV displays, persistence of vision displays, um, and uh, and what we've been doing is developing what we call occupies um, that are um, images that uh, animate these things. So the first one we've developed um, is on traffic fatalities. So as you're riding through an intersection the traffic fatalities at that intersection um, will appear on that on your wheels. So the pedestrian um, 
Uh, the, um, there's a number of other, as you're driving, riding along the um, river bike um, path, the organisms that inhabit the, um, the water, the seahorses in the East River that most people don't know are, are there, um, appear on your wheels, right? So this is information that becomes relevant where it is, ephemerally, and to the people that are there, but doesn't, you know, on a web page somewhere, doesn't really have its situation or its context for making um, meaning. So um, this is another context for kind of taking the abstractions of data and making them more palpable. It's a project called One Trees, which uses cloned uh, genetically ident identical trees that have been micropropagated from a single bunch of adventitious tissue, the stem cells of plants to create sort of a massive twin study, if you will. They're all, I don't know what you call twins that are 6,000 twins would be more than six tuplets, but something. <laughs> um, 6,000 uplets. Um, uh, and some of the, so these have been planted in pairs around the San Francisco Bay Area um, so that over the years they aggregate the differences of the complex environmental variables to which they're exposed. Um, so this is on 20, 22nd and Valencia, uh, where these two trees um, have shown an enormous. Uh, divergence in their growth responses. Um, and I think to, um, to add to, to this, there's a, um, a, a summary picture that um, I want to use the example of how I made sense of this particular, this is the, of all the tree pairs and there's a nice little um, bike map that takes you around the, the hundred pairs that have been planted around the, the Bay Area um, uh, that um, but I, you know, this has been puzzling me for about, this is a 12 year old project and for about six or seven years I was wondering why they were diverging so much and you know the solar, this solar exposure was the same, their water resources were the same, the soil chemistry was the same, the uh, pollution exposure was the same, what the hell was going on, right? And we talked to, you know, so soil scientists and arborists and um, socioecologists and it's actually a construction worker that was kept seeing me sitting there who um, who pointed this out to me something I'd never seen and he said you know the <laughs> look at the look at the houses behind the trees which you can't see in this image but one's a, a low-rise contemporary structure probably built in the 1940s or 50s and the other one's a Victorian house I'd never noticed that I mean I knew that but I'd never I'd never known to think about that. And what he pointed out is that you know between those two was the 1901 earthquake, and building code changed, so they changed foundations. And so the one that's beside, in front of the, you know, the small contemporary structure, um, is probably sort of a massive bonsai. So the the foundations won't let the roots get through, and it has a lot, you know, and made total sense. But it was explained not by any of the experts, but by the construction worker. Who, so how we make sense of things, very complex, irreducibly complex socio-ecological phenomena requires the collective intelligence of many of us not being able to systematically collect data in the same way and make it homogenous, but in our wildly different interpretations, right? It's the, it's the actual diversity of, of us that is our strength when we come to deal with the kinds of design issues that we're faced in the 21st century, we're faced with in the 21st century. You know, these ones that are characterized by irreducible complexity. You know, start trying to improve environmental health or air quality, and it's not a simple um, or straightforward thing. Um, so this is a, um, another project that um, has led to a really um, wonderful collaboration with Usman um, that began with an interesting opportunity that the FAA has provided for us, um, the you know Federal Aviation Authority, to um, uh, this, this is a sorry a sexy new plane called the Icon A5. I'll just get through to it just to see some porn shots of the plane. I keep sorry, <laughs> you know that's what you want to see. Um, some more. No, I don't know. Anyway, so the plane. Um, this is one of 35 new planes that have been coming onto the market that um, um, uh, actually 
give us an interesting opportunity to reimagine urban mobility with um, personal flight. The FAA has tried to introduce very, um, very deliberately a new pilot's license, a new a class of planes. The best ones are coming out of Lithuania, actually. Uh, have to call it? Anyway, I'll, I'll remember it. Um, so these are light um, planes, and, and the new, uh, the new um, pilot license is called a sport pilot license. Um, sounds sporty, right? <laughs> um, but it, it takes you 20 hours to get, uh, so anyone here, what are we today, Wednesday, you could have a pilot license by Monday, right? You could fly to work and a, and a, these planes cost about $100,000. You can get on, there's a, you can buy them now. They're still in manufacturing, but you can um, jump on them. So this is an interesting moment, right? To radically rethink our urban mobility. Um, and uh, and I, this is actually just a summary of a kind of a systems analysis that um, that uh, I think is also useful for understanding what this opportunity is. If we actually look at, at our flight systems um, and looked at the ecological impact of them, what most of our engineering resources is focused on is actually the thrust systems, how to make better aviation flu, uh, fuel that's more efficient. That um, And the, air, uh, the aircrafts have become about 1% more efficient every year for the last 50 years. Can you imagine if automobiles had done that? So they're 50% more efficient. There. Um, uh, but, um, but in commercial airliners, the catering services um, has a larger ecological footprint than the thrust systems and the fuel, right? Because there's about, for a commercial airliner, 80 trucks that bring up bring in goods and how many different materials are on your your airplane meal. Um, count them next time. It's probably between 7 and 15 different materials and different you know, coordination, all of that. So, um, <clears throat> so perhaps we're not doing this uh, correctly. By far and away the biggest ecological impact is of course in the landing infrastructure. So we um, have almost invariably built our airports on on cheap, flat swamps, we used to call them. Now we call them, you know, wetlands, biodiversity hotspots, the most critical ecosystems for sequestering carbon. Um, you know, nurseries for, uh, they protect the terrestrial ecosystem by capturing all the nutrients before it escapes into the aquatic ecosystem. They are nursery for the marine ecosystems. They are the only technology we have for breaking down complex industrial pollutants. These are all, you know, let's retrieve swamps from the swamps of the, the public imagination uh, into how would we reintegrate them into our urban environment. And that's what this project is about um, for San Jose, which was called X Airport, which led into the... So I just want to quickly, this is the landing strip for that Icon A5. It's a 500-foot constructed wetland that we constructed. Um, and uh, will I pull up? Maybe I'll pull it up. Um, because I think it's, sorry, let me go there. Um, um, this is not going to happen as quickly enough. So uh, it's a, so my computer's running too slow. Okay, so I'll, pull up video. I know I've got some embedded video for later, so I'll go back to that. <laughs> Too slow. So it's a 500 foot landing um, strip for the uh, Icon A5, which is an amphibious plane. Um, uh, it costs about $5,000 to build that. Um, for a terrestrial landing strip, it costs about $130,000 and then annual maintenance. Um, so it's smaller and much more cost effective. Now, my computer's being a little bit slow, I'm afraid. I apologize. Um, but um, like, a, like an accessory for the iPhone, the um, wet landing, as it's called, of course, you never have to level a wet landing um, versus a terrestrial landing. So, um, like an iPhone accessory, this is an, the wet landing is an accessory for 
the Icon A5, which can, you know, is a really interesting opportunity for us to radically reimagine urban mobility. Of course, flight need not be the most damaging thing that we do as individuals um, environmentally. Perhaps it's an opportunity to radically rethink our uh, transportation. Maybe I have lost my keynote. Um, so let me um, keep going with that. Um, <laughs> With the uh, the rolling ball, it'll come up eventually. We just have to. It's slow. It's a slow computer. <laughs> it'll just come. Um, so. Um, shot some things down. <laughs> yes. Um, so where was I? Um, the uh, how would you reintegrate the um, uh, wetland back into the urban infrastructure? Of course, you would have to. Um, we furnish them, right? Um, so there, there is a series of, of new wetlanding furniture that includes um, a uh, it includes a heads down display, a heads way down display, and it's I think I think an interesting um, opportunity because our our technologies for work have transformed radically in the last 20 years, right? Actually, in the last two years, actually, you know, um, and yet where we work and how we work. The furniture we use to work, we're still in cafes and and at, in offices and desks, maybe home offices. When we could be, in fact, exploiting, there's no reason why, with your iPad and your iPhone, you couldn't be finishing your thesis, you know, in a, uh, a nice wetland, watching the dragonflies. Um, but it's better than Starbucks, I can tell you that, right? So, um, so this idea of seizing that opportunity to really reintegrate our uh, natural systems, not as non-productive spaces, but actually to use them as workspaces. So I'm actually about to open a tree office in um, in Socrates in a month or so. Anyone who'd like to come to New York and have a really nice office, it's not a tree house, it's a tree office. Um, and actually uh, this is by virtue of the fact that I have declared that all trees in Long Island City as part of this civic action, uh, Noguchi Museum and so Socrates Sculpture Park exhibition, uh, where they've asked me to develop an urban plan. One part of that is that the trees own themselves and the property they stand on. Um, there's legal precedents for this, um, but they can't actually exploit that uh, property ownership until you make them into facilities, which is why, sort of like an Airbnb model, you'll book in your time on your tree office, there's some um, solar power there, um, and it changes the tree and the park from a place of leisure to a place, a productive place, that perhaps, um, you know, demands that we reimagine trees not as decorations along the street or as providing services, uh, air cleaning services, but facilities that... that um, um, so here's some of the wetland furnishings. Thank you. Uh, here's a heads down display. This is a very comfortable pose. Um, um, uh, but the other, I think one of the other things, the problems with kind of really thinking about this opportunity of what flight is, and you know, and when I tell people, you know, you get a, come, to a, come to New York or Australia or there's a few, I'm not sure, I know the UK, the new um, FAA class is not there yet, but you know, come and get a pilot's license and you can fly around, you know, it, try, it strikes terror into the heart of most people. You know, imagine parents giving their children a, a plane to, <laughs> you know, for their 16th birthday, which is the, you know, the tradition of, you know. <laughs> um, and so, you know, our, um, this is a big cultural speed bump, if you will, in kind of really exploring what it might mean to use flight as a new form of urban mobility that doesn't depend on an incredibly heavy, damaging road infrastructure with the road kill and the human kill and the pollutants and the runoff that's associated with it, and does allow us to access and use an existing infrastructure of wet landings. And I had a little promotion for the wet landings about two years ago. The US Airways 
flight that I ha organized to land in that little river we call the Hudson, right? So that was to demonstrate that actually we have a lot of wet landings. Um, but this sort of the, our cultural speed bump um, inhibits our um, imagination. And so this is actually what I call a prosthetic for the imagination. This is a um, strap-on flight simulator that um, uh, you, it allows you to kind of stick out the window of your car and you know, reuse your car as a portable wind tunnel. Um, and here you see that there's actually um, different wing types going here, right? So those of you who don't think of yourselves as expert aeronautical engineers or rocket scientists or aerofoil designers, um, when you've flown these different wing types with the, you know, the, um, the vortex shedding fingered um, bush turkey wings or the, um, the pointed wings of the albatross or seabird and you feel the different stability, you feel actually the, um, the, uh, the difference in the angle of attack and your maneuverability you have a kind of a visceral understanding of what that is. We have a little iPhone app too that um, we call the strap on black box um, and it logs your acceleration changes and you can um, upload that um, to, um, to earn your wings if you will and then when you have earned your wings you can strap on these 16 foot wings and then practice your wet landings um, flying along. And this was the basis of um, of the collaboration that Usman and I did in something called Flight Path Toronto in October of last year, which was, um, unlike Usman, I have no experience in doing um, spectacles for, what was it, a million people that they predicted? 700,000 to a million people who would come to the Nuit Blanche event. Um, in downtown Toronto. So what we did was actually set up um, flight path with, uh, in this case it was 15 towers, a few of them 80 foot high, where um, people could go to flight school. Um, anybody, any member of the public could go to flight school, could um, uh, do a quick written test um, and get an autopilot license. Of course you sign it yourself. Um, uh, and then um, uh, strap up to uh, this is to show that it was very popular with grandmothers um, and um, here we have some Um, and strap in and fly over this. Um, so what I would call this is a um, the people who were assembled below. There was um, we, we can maybe talk about this afterwards because these lasers were very interesting. They were actually raised by people's voices. So as you're flying, you flew through these these ephemeral walls. Um, and um, uh, allowed, you know, a very something I didn't believe this man about. But when you when you control light, you feel like the end of the kind of blind man uh, walking stick. You actually feel a direct visual connection with that light that you created. So, um, but what I'm really interested in is um, how this changes what is possible. So a public spectacle it helps us to really rethink, it creates a shared public memory of what's possible. So, or beyond the bike lane, right? If that's the most radical transformation that our urban centers are making, bike lanes, and you know, can we get beyond that? And there's certainly a whole lot of school kids who saw this, and the kids couldn't fly, unfortunately. They had to get, um, they had to get uh, you know, the strap-on flight simulators as a compensation. They weren't legally allowed to fly them, but um, but they, um, you know, they immediately said, "Well, I could zip line to school, right? It's fast, inexpensive, emissionless. My kids are always saying, you know, we'll be on time, right? <laughs> um, so uh, 
the sort of identifying and making possible more radical forms of innovation um, to make them tangible, believable, and explore is really um, interesting. So this is the project I'm just doing now to try and set up a, um, a zip line in uh, Long Island City with this project I mentioned, and I'll just quickly f um, go through this because some of the urban consequences of this are interesting. So this is a simple diagram of a project um, called the um, Upgraded Elevator, um, which takes the elevator and um, actually swaps in the a, a Gen 2 elevator, which you probably know all the Gen 2 machine roomless elevators are about 75% more efficient just because of some mechanical changes. And then you can get, um, you can actually get uh, regenerative braking, right? So they capture energy on the way down. Um, but what, what, um, by fiat in the Long Island City, all the elevators must, must be upgraded and they must actually extend 30% above the height of the building, right? Because if you know nothing about Long Island City, it just faces off, it's a little part of New York City that faces off Manhattan. So it's, it's an extraordinary place that you can see that, you know, arguably one of the most spectacular skylines in the, in the world and you can't see it from anywhere. So if you go up this elevator at least, you can see um, it produces the view. It realizes the asset of the view that Long Island City does. But it also actually creates a thermal differential. The greenhouse effect heats up a glass box on the top of a roof, right? Um, hot air rises. That pulls uh, air through. And it's th we've estimated 30% head in order to replace your standard HVAC system. That's how much circulation you will get from that. And then it also, of course, produces a staging area of the roof, the underutilized uh, roof area where you can start to think about in the case of Long Island City, you know, instead of um, Tomcat Bakery, one of the 25 commercial bakeries that delivers fresh, airy, artisanal bread all over New York City and plumes of diesel fumes to Long Island City residents, right? Uh, you know, we can zip line it very radically and expensively, less than the cost of one biodiesel truck. Um, we can have the infrastructure of zip lines to um, zip line it down to the water, which is, of course, um, a radically efficient and inexpensive form of um, transportation and the reason d'etre of, of Manhattan, New York City anyway, is, is to have these water-based transportation. So we get this um, uh, shared system where the elevator actually becomes, a, you know, uh, you get increased head, so an increased regenerative braking opportunity. It becomes a little micro power station, uh, improves the air, and onward. Uh, so, um, so we have a, a network of of um, manufacturing facilities that can then start zip lining around um, Long Island City. Um, so I, I just want to wrap up with a couple of kind of less. Um, Ambitious projects uh, recently launched a platform called the Exercise Platform at the clinic um, uh, and export, which um, is personal training um, for, you know, in Manhattan, there's things that happen that um, this on the street front, it's Dwayne Reed's um, chains of, of pharmacists, um, banks, and health clubs. They've, you know, they've become so popular that now. You know, you're walking along the street and people are on, the, it's just extraordinary, the metastasization of, of them. But anyway, so this idea that in fact you could couple personal training, uh, you know, for your own, if you wanted to flatten your tummy and build up your deltoids and, you know, get that nice six pack, you could also actually do it to improve environmental health. So each person gets a, um, a personal training program for their exercise and they might have something in it like, um, Hula hooping, the hula hoops have been adapted with wildflower seeds. So as you hula hoop, which anyone who does it um, knows that it's great for building up that six pack, right? Core body conditioning. Um, but you also distribute perennial flowers for the invaluable insects and pollinators that we depend on. Um, I'm gonna finish off, this is actually one of the new sports. Um, I'll just show you quickly, it's rhinoceros beetle wrestling. Um, but I think um, I can see we're getting restless. Um, so um, I'll just give you a little preview of, of a, uh, a new sport. Um, I need to talk about this because I became fascinated with this, um, this issue or the possibility of interacting with, you know, 
these heroes of the underworld because um, I was walking along in Madrid uh, about three years or four years ago and um, this rhinoceros beetle leapt on me. Right? I swear it was the same rhinoceros beetle that I played with as a kid in Queensland, Australia. Right? The same, you know, the ones here are like kind of the black, shiny, you know, every bit as intimidating as a bull. Um, and, you know, actually the strongest animals in the world, the strongest organisms in the world. Um, so this is a, a sport that's actually the, um, this scales the human forces to beetle scale and the beetle forces to human scale, so it's a level playing field and visually does the same. I offer a scholarship in my um, program for rhinoceros beetle champion wrestlers, so anyone who wants to come and study with me can, can do that. So I'll just finish up quickly because I actually want to hear um, what... Uh, Pharmacy might not work here because this is actually how you spell pharmacy, but in English, of course, we spell pharmacy, P-H. Um, but this is a, a urban agriculture initiative that, um, that has allowed me to explore soft architecture um, and you know, really think through how we might very inexpensively deploy, very quickly deploy that technology of leaf area index to improve air quality, but also to produce edibles. So pharmacy, the charge of it is to actually do urban agriculture so that we're not just reducing the negative damage of, of you know, which is reducing the pesticides, reducing the, the food miles, reducing the carbon footprint, reducing the, you know, the um, runoff or, you know, reducing the negative damage of our food systems. But can we take the challenge of actually designing food systems that actually improve environmental health measurably? And, and produce edibles. And so that's what the pharmacy project is about. And I, I want to end with showing you this because it's an invitation. This is a project that's very much in, um, uh, very much working on. And I'd love for anyone who um, is interested in urban agriculture to collaborate on this thing. It's based on a very simple ag bag system, which is Tyvek, um, which uh, you might know from. FedEx envelopes, so what you might not know is that it's not only waterproof, it actually also breathes. That means that we can make a growing environment, um, a closed system growing environment with an adapted SIP technology, sub-irrigation technology using a polymer similar to the polymer you find in diapers, in nappies, in, um, you know, that sucks the water. So instead of draining the water out, running it into the stormwater, running it as pollutant somewhere else, you actually expand these water crystals um, so it drains it out of the soil locally, creates these micro reservoirs, and then re-releases it back to the soil. So you get a very intensive um, water conservation uh, closed agriculture system. We can do agriculture without degrading the watershed. And so this is the, um, you know, the first implementations and prototypes I've had going the last uh, two seasons growing seasons where you can see it turns any railing, double hung window or parapet into a um, arable territory out of thin air. Um, and uh, you know, there's, we can go on about how it works. Uh, this is a facade I did recently. You can see the plants in here are actually very uh, young because we just turned this into a berry farm. Um, this is the facade of Postmaster's Gallery in Chelsea. Um, and I got a class one violation from the Department of Buildings for doing this because I didn't have the right permit. Um, and when I went to court, they made us take it down. So um, we didn't get to actually grow them last season in that kind of, because class one violation is like next to jail. Um, and, um, and then, of course, I asked, well, what, how, what permit would I use? And the judge, of course, said, I don't know. <laughs> there isn't a permit for uh, vertical urban agriculture. But this is a radically inexpensive system that can be expanded um, to take advantage of the um, railings and to explore intensification methods um, incredibly inexpensively when you look at, if you're interested in vertical urban agriculture systems, you know it's about $5,000 a square foot and these, of course, um, cost very little. Um, so I won't go on, but there's some collective so I'll, well, I'll finish with this. this come, th perhaps the most interesting part of this project is the how information or data is is um, 
managed with this and I hope actually to instrument this with the um, with the platform that you developed um, <laughs> it, um, shortly um, uh, but for now we've only been using these uh, very inexpensive methods so this is actually a calendar around here January February March through um, uh, <coughs> through December um, every time something blooms it uh, or leaves out you actually mark it on the calendar system every time you see a bee or a bird appear you mark it on the calendar system um, you're out you know it's in your domestic space it's not even like it's in your backyard so you, it's quite intimate you see it often every day um, and you break that kind of culture nature divide right where you don't write on you know something you write on is inside it's got no vegetation it's not you know here you're actually writing rethinking where that divide is I actually put all my Google Calendar events my grant deadlines on this too because I actually much prefer to look at my calendar in this cyclical way and um, and then we get you know this is Doni who's one of the um, you farmers or urban farmers who um, has been great at growing her um, system she got a, a really full yield from on the inside she had edible flowers on the outside she had tay berries which are a blackberry raspberry cross um, and uh, experimented with um, how to augment the soil with she actually runs marketing for um, Vita Coco coconut juice which is now the number one drink beat out Coca-Cola Pepsi in Brazil and fast becoming that all over the world so um, uh, actually the the core which is the byproduct of coconut juice making um, is a cellulosic material that can replace peat which is one of the reasons why we are still you know tearing up wetlands these critical ecosystems for you know household potted plants um, and we could so she's been experimenting with that um, and there's a, uh, a lot of ways in which we can draw on the collective knowledge to address what is the uh, you know I would argue is the space race of the 21st century urban agriculture is how we might um, or we have to we think we have to address we have to understand how to hack our food systems so that we're not you know compromising the cardiovascular health of each of us to deliver a loaf of bread and that we're not um, doing the same uh, so I think through these kind of collective strategies we can start to radically reimagine and draw on the biggest resource that we have the biggest renewable resource that we have which is the collective intelligence of many of us doing you know interesting experiments to uh, address how we might improve our shared environmental health and you know look forward to a tasty and biodiverse future thank you Oh, yes, I'm oh, very good. Very good. Thank you.